that stands up. You all know who the speaker is today, but you're probably wondering who the hell I am. Um, my name is Guru Beer Singh. I work here in uh, the, one of the many security teams. Um, I'm also the chair of the Northwest Regional Branch of the IISP, and they're the ones who organize this meeting. Um, before I introduce our speaker, just a couple of very important bits of information. <clears throat> Fred's come all the way from London, and he'd like to get back there tonight. <laughs> and he's trained at quarter past nine. Um, I'll be dropping him off at the train station at about nine. We finish at 8.30, and as you know, these buildings out of hours are a bit awkward. So I've arranged <clears throat> for the security guard to let us out at 8.30. So by 8.30, we all need to congregate near the reception. You all need to remember <coughs> to give me that pass, please. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll be a bit of a problem. Uh, so about 8.30, we will all leave and um, um, all go through the main door in one go, pretty much. It triggers up all arms and everything. <laughs> um, the other thing to remember is there's always lots of tea and coffee left here. So, before we start in the next few moments, if you can, feel free to get some, um, otherwise it really gets left over. Gents and ladies, I've told you, it's just over there, and you won't need to go anywhere else besides here, ladies or gents, and the exit, so you can just stay in this tiny building, please. Um, <coughs> these meetings uh, are recorded. Fred's kind of agreed to that, and they're usually available on YouTube. It's uh, not for profit, not commercial concern whatsoever. Um, if you don't want to mention your name, um, what I normally do is uh, have an introduction of everybody, because part of this activity is supposed to support networking. We won't do that today, <laughs> here for quite some time. So, um, but the recording of this uh, presentation, editing, uh, version of it will be available on YouTube. So just be aware of that. If you do say something, it will be recorded. You don't your name to So, um, if we move on to the presentation this evening then. Um, Fred Piper, uh, he gained his degree, first class, first class August, 1962. And you got your PhD two years later. Mm -hmm. PhD in two years. Mm -hmm. I don't have to say anything more than that. <laughs> Dealing with somebody who's quite unique and special. He's still a professor at um, Royal Holloway in London. Lovely. How's that for your office? Terrific. <laughs> <coughs> um, Fred's been speaking and consulting on information technology, information security uh, for a long time, and he travels all over the world. Uh, Europe, USA, China, and today he's made it he's here in Manchester. Is it your first time in Manchester? Yeah, no, I've been here many times. <laughs> um, just a few it's words. First time it hasn't been raining. <laughs> <laughs> it was warmer than London. I came here for the World Cup in 1966. Really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> There's just so many amazing things about this guy I've still yet to learn. It's not amazing, it's just a fact. <laughs> well, it's... Uh, if you weren't born in 1966. <laughs> <laughs> I, I noticed, uh, you might not know, actually, I, I, I'm aware that we actually do have quite a lot of students here today, and some of the students are so well dressed, you wouldn't believe the students. I just, you're all welcome. Um, and when I was a student, it was tradition, it was free, you'd take it. So a lot of biscuits and teas and coffees. I don't know, students have changed in uh, these years. Um, so Fred's written um, a lot of research papers, as you'd expect uh, of an academic. But he's also written six books, uh, four of them on cryptography. In addition to uh, many, if you look on the Royal Hallways website, there's many uh, credits to um, his name, and I'll just mention a few of them. Um, he's very, uh, key thing I should say also for today, because uh, of the IISP connection, Fred was instrumental in setting that up. He's a board member even today. If you're wondering what the ISP is, feel free to have a chat with me later. And, and also, because Fred has to leave fairly hastily afterwards, 
He will have his name and uh, email address and um, contact details on the screen. If you do need to contact him, he doesn't carry any business cards. Do feel free to make a note. And somebody asked me for some paper to write on, didn't they? Who was that? Yeah. I've got some just here for you. I haven't forgotten. Um, <coughs> the Fred's got, uh, as I say, he's, he's, he's uh, an honorary um, member even at uh, the university where he's teaching now, and he's travelled all the way from from London. He's not charging us for it; it's all free. And Fred's going to be talking to us about cryptography from black art to popular science. Fred. Okay, thank you. Yes, I mean. I am part of the ISSP, I'm on the board of the ISSP, I did help set it up. I'm not here to persuade you to join the ISP. I'd love you to join, but do talk to Gubi about that afterwards. I do apologise, I have to rush off. Gubi very kindly offered to put me up tonight, but I've got a meeting in London tomorrow, this morning. So I will have to leave fairly properly. The title is so clear, and the object, the first objective has got to be to enjoy ourselves. If I don't enjoy what I'm doing, I'll get bored. If I get bored, you'll get bored more bored. So please keep me stimulated and interrupt as often as you like. I love being heckled. I'm quite happy to be heckled. All I'm going to do really is look at some implementation issues for cryptographic systems and just see how cryptography has changed in the last 40 years. But, as I say, I have a lecture prepared. I personally don't care if I don't get past this slide. If you've got questions, just ask and we'll see what happens. All this started really when I was asked to, to find out from industry what they had, what problems industry had with implementing cryptography. And the first, the only consensus amongst all of them was we're not worried about the algorithms. Algorithms are okay. We, we trust the design of algorithms. So we've got serious concerns about recent events. Did you notice know, on RSA they where large companies were compromised in some sense, and I'll say a little bit of that later. They weren't sure how they should regard the possibility of quantum computers coming along, and were very alarmed that nobody in authority was giving them instructions on how to behave, including the government. But cryptography needs standards, which change slowly, but industry needs flexibility, because industry has to change very fast. And typically, Academics were given here. Academics were recommending that the hardware should be changed every almost every six months, and systems can't be changed for a three-year, four-year cycle. So it was a complete mismatch between theory and practice. And then they wanted early warnings about necessary changes, and they felt the government would let them down. So these were the concerns expressed. If you from a company share those concerns with others, then we can discuss them as we go on. Here's my potted history of cryptography. Prior to 1975, it was a black art, practiced mainly by governments and the military, and nobody had the hell to knew what was going on in any way, shape, or form. In the early 80s, courses started, and customers started to know what they required. But still, even in the early 80s, 1980s, most customers took what the vendors offered them without really knowing why it was there or how they could improve it. And then in the early 1990s, qualification started. I mean, our MSc started in 1992, for instance. And once the qualification started, and once information security or cryptography started to become academic subjects, then the security manager had a chance to get qualifications. And it is certainly true that in the 80s, being appointed as security manager was almost a punishment. But basically, companies, all the all the plum positions were taken. If there was one senior person left and one security man hadn't been filled, he was put in there. That stopped round about the early 1990s or late 1990s, and now it's a popular science. And not only is it popular science in the sense that everybody knows about it, but it's fundamental to e-commerce, e-government, and various other internet, anything to do with the internet. Now, the first important thing to say is popular does not mean it's easy. If there are students in the room who suddenly think cryptography is going to be a doddle because it's such a popular science, it isn't. And the analogy, a very good analogy, I think, is golf. Golf is arguably one of the most popular of the individual sports going on. Anybody can swing a golf club. 
So occasionally anybody will make a good stroke. But if you really want to be a professional, it's hard work and it requires lots and lots of training and lots and lots of practice. And the same thing is true of almost any aspect of British accuracy. But what's happened is because it's a popular science, I'm often asked who is Royal Holloway's best student. And I never answer it. And there are many reasons. One is I don't know what a statement means. Second is it wouldn't be fair to all the others. Third is I just don't want it. But I do know who our most famous ex student is. And it's very easy to tell you. It's a lady called Sophie Neveu, who was the French cryptographer in the Da Vinci Code. And if you read the Da Vinci Code, I trained her. We trained her at Holloway. And we got more publicity from that than any of the <laughs> academic awards we've ever had. This was our biggest coup. So there's no doubt she is our most famous student, although she never existed. But she put us on the map, on the popular map. <coughs> and this is a true story, but a little embarrassing for certain people, that I, when the book came out, I had to read the book in order to talk to the press and so on. And it's a dreadful book, quite frankly. <laughs> the film wasn't too bad, but the book's pretty good and awful. But I was actually asked by an audience like this, someone who says, what was she like as a student? And the rest of the audience laughed, and I had the clue what to say. <laughs> so fortunately, by the audience laughing, I just said, nothing really, I just let them laugh, and that was it. So, some, some more important things is, why is the profile of encryption growing? Well, one is, undoubtedly, with things like the Da Vinci Code, the popularization of Fletcher Park, and so on. But there's also some very serious reasons, like the increase in volume of communications over insecure channels, the increased requirement for remote access to information, the regulation, the, for instance, the Data Protection Act talks about giving adequate protection. It doesn't specify cryptography, but <coughs> more and more it's moving towards adequate means encryption. The need for electronic equipment, handwritten signatures and so on, and most of all, what, what I got in it for is it can be fun. It really can be fun. It's a serious subject, but you can enjoy it. Modern cryptography, in some sense, started at Bletchley Park um, in the Second World War. I don't know, have any of you been to Bletchley Park? It's well worth going. It's an interesting museum, fascinating story. Um, but of course, the war, the war finished in 1945. And modern cryptography didn't really start till 1975. And the reason was a 30 year embargo when nobody knew actually what happened at Bletchley Park. So once it happened, then it influenced everything going on. And there have been a lot of important changes since 45, and I'll list them roughly. We've got software, we've got fast computers, we've got new communication media, binary codes, increasing general awareness, many applications public key cryptography, and I'll sell you that data. But the most important of all is, whereas in the 19, early 1980s, information security really just meant cryptography, managing a few hardware boxes, and protecting communications and so on. It's now a much part of a much wider discipline called information security, and it's information security that is really the theme why I'm here. I talk about cryptography, but it's in the setting of information security that we have the institute. The institute is not an institute of cryptography. Cryptography is just one tool. So I'll say later on. Yep. You have the rest of the park there on yep. the screen. Um, one of the guys I always associate with Bethany Park is Alan Turing. Yep. And he obviously did come to Manchester. Yep. Did Alan Turing do much work on cryptography uh, in, the, in the way that you understand it? Oh, yes. In fact, he um, was the Colossus computer, uh -huh. which he didn't design. You know, that was designed by a man called Tommy Flowers from BT. But he was instrumental in bringing that in and using automation to break algorithms. I mean, basically, cryptanalysis in any way, shape, or form requires a lot of guessing. Right? And the good cryptanalyst is the one who minimizes the number of guesses you have to make. He produced the answer of guessing. 
And then he, he used automation to do the guessing for the team so that you speed it up. And so, I always think of his work, uh, who he's well known for, uh, the Turing machine as uh, um, math, a highly mathematical analysis of intelligence. That's right. But it's just as applicable to technology. It is, but that came later. I mean, the Turing, the, the concept of the Turing machine wasn't used, I don't think, much during the war. Right. The, um, the bomb, for instance, if you try to find a key, <coughs> And you really do it by a process of elimination. You find you you eliminate the wrong keys rather than guessing the right key. Yeah. And so the thing like the bomb was the Turing was the device invention. And basically <coughs> you gave it it went through lots of guesses yeah. and stopped when it might have a right one. And then someone else had to do some more work to decide which right which one that might have been the right one was the right one. Yeah. So yes, he did quite a lot. There's no question. And then so did a lot of other people to give the impression that Turing was the cryptography <coughs> that she part be wrong. There were a whole host of people of whom he's the most famous. But he's probably most famous because he'd other things as well, like computing in Manchester, so he was here to work on the wasn't it the ACE computer in Manchester? Um, was it called the ACE computer? I think it was. That's a Leo. Yeah. Yeah. And, and <coughs> you're, you're a, as a board member at Bletchley Park, for those of us who haven't been there. Uh, if we go there these days, what can we see? I understand they've got a copy of the uh, of one of the original Enigma machines. Oh, they've got plenty of Enigma machines. Yes, they've got. <laughs> they, there were many different versions of the Enigma machine, right. and they have a quite large collection on display. Uh, and uh, just in case you don't know, Fred did say, "Feel free to interrupt me." So, feel free. Mm. <laughs> yes, I mean. Um, so again, what is information security? Well, I don't want to teach my grandmother side eggs, but basically, if you take the CIA model, then the important thing is the term unauthorized, unauthorized, and ensuring information when you need it. So the key thread to confidentiality, integrity, and availability is this concept of being authorized. And you can't be authorized, there's no point being authorized if the system can't tell the difference between authorised people and unauthorised people. So authentication is one of the crucial aspects of cryptography. And what people have learnt during the years is that there are two ways to attack information <coughs> systems from a security aspect. One is to try to break the technology. The other is to impersonate authorised users. And more and more we're seeing that people are attacking cryptographic systems and other systems by impersonating authorised users rather than breaking the technology. So authentication has become absolutely crucial to the whole of security and is absolutely crucial to cryptography. And just in case you don't know, do you all know the joke about how you beat a grandmaster at chess? I'll tell you anyway, if you know it, just laugh at the appropriate moment. But basically, <coughs> there was a young guy who was claiming he could beat a grandmaster at chess. And people were going to wager a lot of money with him, said, look, I'm so good I can beat two of them simultaneously. I can play two of them simultaneously. So a lot of people put money on it. This is a story, really, not the truth. So he puts one in one room, one in another room, and then he plays the first man, makes a move, and he goes back in the other room <coughs> and makes the move that the first man made to the second room. <laughs> so he's got them playing each other with him as just a traffic. So he's guaranteed to beat, either beat one of them or stalemate with both of them. And that's a very good example. You want to illustrate the concept of authentication band in the middle. They're playing each other. They don't know they're playing each other. They both think they're playing the man in the middle, but the man in the middle doesn't need to go play chess in this particular story. It can be defeated by getting them into a time scramble. Sorry? It can be defeated by getting them into a time scramble. Oh, well, there are many ways of defeating it. Don't take it too seriously. It's just <laughs> <laughs> if you ever have to defeat it. Yeah. Sorry? If you ever have to defeat it, that would be the way of doing that. Of course. If you had to defeat it, you'd say, well, where do you keep disappearing? You can't make the <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, there are many ways of defeating it. It's not, it's not a serious example, just to, to illustrate the concept of the man in the middle. And usually the man in the middle is stopping the two people at the end communicating. This man in the middle is making them communicate without knowing it. So it's almost the inverse of the usual security model. 
And what's the only definition of a cipher system? Well, cryptographic system, you have a message, you want to send it on an insecure channel, that's why the interceptor's put there to indicate it's insecure. You encrypt it with a key, you decrypt it with another key, and in this picture they're the same, that's because it's an early definition. So in the early days all systems were cryptic, were symmetric, and then the diagram's incomplete until you broke the key establishment channel. And then if you've got an algorithm that can't be defeated here, the early attacks were to attack it here. And that's how the Enigma was broken, for instance, not because it was weak. It had weaknesses, but the Enigma would not have been broken in the war had this channel not had to exist because they were able to expose, expose the keys. And so. so if you have symmetric encryption, which is the example there, it doesn't make sense to put that picture on its own because it doesn't tell the whole story. You've got to have that. And this needs to be secure. And if there's an intercept here, you're in trouble. So you've got to have a secure channel in order to have secure communications over an insecure channel. And that's one of the limitations, one of the many limitations. I'm so how do you keep a secret? Well, the obvious thing is don't let anyone have access to the information. And so really, cryptography is not about keeping secrets, it's about sharing secrets. It's usually about sharing secrets. And then you disguise it so unauthorized people can't understand it. And shared secrets lie on trust, and I'm not going to define what trust is, but trust is of two <coughs> types. It's a technical trust in technical ability, and it's an emotional trust in the sense of their honesty. And you need to trust people, processes, and technology. And at all times, you've got to know exactly what you're trusting. If you're trusting a piece of hardware, you've got to know what you're trusting it for. If you're trusting people, you've got to know what you're trusting them for. If you're trusting the process, you've got to know what you're trusting that for. And usually, you can't isolate the three. They all go together. Now, we had this discussion earlier. Right? If you're using cryptography to protect your information, <coughs> then there will be a key to which you must deny everybody access. And if that key is lost, and the algorithm is strong, then your data will be lost forever. Now, let's be quite clear what lost means. If you are trying to send confidential information, suppose I'm trying to send a bit of confidential information, and you break it, and you know the information. We haven't lost the information in the sense that he still knows it and I still know it, but we've lost it in the, lost it in the confidentiality sense in the sense that you know it as well. If you encrypt your data with a key and you lose the key, then you have lost the data. And that is a very real problem. I used to make a living 20 or 30 years ago designing algorithms. And I was asked, can you make an algorithm that you can't break? And the answer is yes. So someone wanted one, so I gave it to them. They came back a little later and said, Fred, we've lost the key. Can you get the data back for us? I said, no. <laughs> and they thought I was joking at first. I said, no, no, you, you asked me to get an algorithm I couldn't break. So I've done it. And I can't break it. So they said, what are we going to do? I said, there's nothing you can do. You can try and break the algorithm, but I can't. And if you can't break the algorithm, you've lost the data. And that is a fact of life. And so if you are outsourcing, <clears throat> like the cloud, for instance, you want to be quite sure <laughs> if you haven't got a copy of the key, then be careful. So you want to say. <laughs> now, what do you mean by breaking an algorithm? Well, being able to break an algorithm means determining the plain text from the cipher text without being given the key. And usually that means finding the key, but it doesn't always. And there's one thing that's always theoretically possible you can just guess. And nobody can stop you guessing. Right? So an exhaustive key search is really just guessing systematically all keys. And if you try all keys, you must find the right one. Now you need some way of recognising whether it's the right one or the wrong one, but that's usually easy. And so no system's going to be totally secure. And the best the cryptographer can do is give you an algorithm where the easiest attack 
is an exhaustive key search. So a well-designed algorithm is one where the easiest attacks an exhaustive key search. Unfortunately, well-designed doesn't mean strong. <coughs> because if you've only got a small number of keys, it can't be strong. So a strong algorithm is one that's well-designed and with a large number of keys. Now don't ask what a large number is because it changes every year, every two years or whatever. So just say large, meaning at the moment large probably means 2 to the 80, 2 to the 90 keys. But it'll change as Moore's law gets better. And history is full of instances where algorithms were thought to be well designed, but they've been broken. But now you have to be very, very careful. Because broken is an emotive word. And you see many, many headlines that say such and such a system is broken. And you have to know what it means. Because broken in the literal sense means cannot be used. Broken in this sense means it may have a potential weakness which may not apply to you because your circumstances don't <coughs> allow the attack. So look very carefully because often attacks work only in unrealistic conditions chosen by the attacker. Come in, come in. Did you announce that they should turn off their mobiles? No. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so when you see that something's been broken, whether it's an algorithm, a system or whatever, Always understand the assumptions associated with the breaking. And if you take cryptography, various attacks take ciphertext only, known plain text attack, and chosen plain text attack. And there are many algorithms, like Gaze was a very good example, that was broken under certain chosen plain text attacks, which were completely unrealistic in the real world, so the banks would carry on using Gaze even though these chosen plain text attacks. Been exhibited. So, what are, we, what are we trying to do? What are we trying to do the whole time? Well, we're trying to introduce a secure channel, and the secure channel in inverted commas means because it's almost contradictory terms, right? An insecure channel means somewhere where interception is possible. So, you want to send information securely over an insecure channel. And that's almost a tautology, it's almost a contradiction in terms. What it means is you send your information over the channel in such a way that you can't stop the interceptor obtaining what's sent, but from what sent they cannot determine the message. And cryptography is one of the important tools. Another tool that's gaining more and more um, credence in this area is steganography. Steganography is where you send the information hidden in a message so no one even knows there's data in the message. I, I did a channel television program once and I was stitched up by the interviewer in a, what could have been a very embarrassing way. But fortunately for me, there was a lady belly dancer who was a steganography specialist and she stole the program. <laughs> and it was so interesting to her, they forgot the little gap that I'd been set up for, and I escaped. So the steganography is really coming, and you shouldn't take your eye off it. So how do you attack cryptographic systems? Well, the passive interceptor just tries to break the algorithm. The passive means you're not changing anything. But the active interceptor has many more options. An interception is not necessarily the best form of attack. In fact, more and more it's becoming most definitely not the best form of attack. Other forms of attack modes, you attack the protocols, you might attack the key management, you might attack the hardware, and I'll say a little bit about all these in general. You might impersonate the genuine user so that people actually give you the keys, thinking you're the legitimate receiver. Or Espionage, and espionage is a good old fashioned term, but it's, if you believe the headlines in the last few days, <laughs> it still goes on and we don't go down that route in the moment. So, is public key built on a sound basis? Public key cryptography. Public key cryptography, do you all know what public key cryptography is? Do I need to explain it? I think it would be useful for, um, for a reminder for me as well. Okay. Well, in the first diagram I put up, can I avoid not going back? 
the sender and the receiver have the same key. And therefore you have this problem of sending the key, they had to share a key somehow, so the sender, usually it would be the sender, had to send to the receiver this secret key in advance of sending the encrypted message. Public key systems is where the encryption key is no longer a secret and can be made public. So all the receiver needs is their own deciphering key and therefore you've got no problem of distributing keys in the first place. So public key cryptography, the enciphering key and deciphering key are different. The enciphering key can be made public and it's, I use the phrase, computationally feasible to determine the deciphering key from the enciphering key. And the public key is unique to you and also helps to identify you as a mechanism for authenticating your... Well, no, the secret key will be used to identify you. The public key, everybody will know. Everybody will use your public key if in the situation you're talking about to identify you because mm -hmm. only you can use your secret key. Mm -hmm. now, there's a lot of mathematics behind that and I don't really want to get involved in <laughs> mathematics. Thank you. Um, and I'll say a little bit later on because there's the issue of instead of having to keep the key secret, you need to be sure whose public key you're using. <clears throat> and I'll come to that in a bit later on. But at that time, this was the 1980s, Public key cryptography was just coming in, and a very famous man called Donald Davies, who actually worked with Turing at NPL on the, I think, I think these computer was at NPL, not in Manchester. Yeah. Gave a lecture to the London Mathematical Society, which is the cream of pure mathematicians. Sort of with many cryptographic systems around the inability of mathematicians to do mathematics. Yeah. And that's because I'll give you your public key, and from the public key, although we knew how to determine the private key or the deciphering key mathematically, we couldn't do the mathematics. And a very good example is factoring. RSA relies on factoring large numbers. Anybody in this room could write an algorithm that in theory will factor a large number. The problem is if you do, you know, for i equals 1 up to root n, divide n by i, if the remainder is 0, you've got to factor if it isn't increase i by 1, that for the size of number we're talking about, your grandchildren will be dead before the computer gives you the answer. And that's what we mean by computation feasible. And I'll say a bit more about that later. But he wasn't joking too much. Because mathematically, we know how to break these systems. We just can't implement the mathematics on the computers, on today's computers either. Was it tiny and cheap? Yes, he was there to bait the mathematician because he was a computer scientist and I'd asked him to do it. The whole point he's really making is existence proof do not provide solutions because if you give him a cryptogram, you know there's a message. So you know the message exists, it doesn't help you to find it. And the algorithms should be implementable. And we had breaking RSA, we had many, many factoring algorithms, but they couldn't work in real time for the numbers the being So are today's albums future-proof? Well, symmetric albums, if they're well designed, and key search is the best attacks, then the main concern is just nothing more than advancing <coughs> technology. And Moore's law has been fairly reliable, so unless quantum computers come, taking Moore's law as the guidance, and exactly, you're putting your own safety factor, people are reasonably happy that symmetric algorithms are on a firm basis. But public key or asymmetric algorithms or public key algorithms were always concerned about mathematical advances and there's always the threat of quantum computers coming. Now, do any of you work in quantum? Yes. Yes? Yes. So, if you had to stake your life on it, would you Tell me a quantum computer will exist in 20 years? Well, not one that will do anything useful in the face of the algorithms you want. Can I take that as a no? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, so basically, the world believes that quantum computers are going to be here for, let's say, 50 years, and that there will be plenty of warning 
when they come. That may be a wrong assumption, but that's what we're working on. So most organizations have a watching brief on quantum computers, but not investing a lot of money trying to build them. There are a few exceptions, but there are mainly academic institutions. But we're always concerned about mathematical advances. For instance, if you take factoring of RSA, factoring of large numbers, you can do your um, Moore's law type calculations and predict what size you need in 15 years' time or so. But, and this, ha this has happened in my lifetime since I've been working on cryptography, an advance in the mathematical factoring algorithm can have the effect of advancing by 12 years your calculations on Moore's law. So there's always the fear that some mathematical genius is going to go to bed, wake up in the morning with a new factoring algorithm that might solve all these problems. Just learn to live with it. Mathematicians <laughs> learn to live with it, but you have to be aware that you could have. Is, is there a sense in which um, the different types of encryption the amount of time that that encryption has to stay valid would change because yes. my, my credit card details if somebody finds out what what I sent via transaction in 10 years time that's not going to worry me because my that's credit right. card's that's, gone that's but more an application dependent <coughs> thing. I mean that that's that's an application dependent question not an algorithm dependent question you look at your application you make a decision that says I want my information secure for X years or X seconds or X minutes. Is that a decision that's often made though really? Yes. All right, okay. It's a decision, I mean for instance government secrets in this country are 30 years. The police panda cars, do you still have police panda cars in Manchester? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the police panda car, basically they send that instruction to the police car, go to some address, once they're there it doesn't matter if anybody knows they're coming because they're there. So they only need weak encryption. And there is a very real market for weak encryption. Where weak means you can break it in half an hour. And I hope that the Manchester police are there in less than half an hour if it's a serious offence. So it doesn't matter. And all this happened in, in London. There was a bank holiday. And there was a very serious plane crash, I think, at Heathrow, and all the drivers around were just, just flocked to Heathrow out of curiosity, and the, so the emergency service couldn't get there because all this traffic was blocked. So they started encrypting their routine messages, but they only needed encryption for 30 minutes. They just did really speech inverters, <clears throat> which were enough for that particular application. And there is a real market for low-level encryption in certain applications. But I think you have to... I would answer your question by saying, look at the application, decide how long you want the information secure for, multiply it by 10, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then risk it. And it is all risk, right? Because someone could guess the key first time, no matter how big it is. It's just that the bigger the key size, the less likely you are to guess it in your cover time. Does that answer it? Well, it does very well. Thank you. Are there any sort of reference sites that, that, that sort of show the current expected um, longevity of, of, of current algorithms? You know, how, how long the AS256 is expected to last before it yes. gets broken? Yes. Well, for the. Sorry, in case you don't know, AES is a recent standard. And whenever these standards are published, if you read the launch date, it says this can be used for X years, and it says 25 years for the AES. But that was from 2002, I think, until from memory. So it's got a life cycle. And when DES was introduced in 1975 or 6, whenever it was, they said 15 years. So for the major standard algorithm, at the launch, there will be a statement that says, "Don't use it for longer than something like that." Are those numbers sort of um, reviewed on, on any kind of regular basis? Yes, it, uh, as well. The, as the they're, they're certainly reviewed. Um,
frequently there's a group of seven authors, I, I can't remember the names, but I can send you the reference. If you email me, I'll send you the reference. There are seven authors of which one of them's one of the Lentures, Arjun Lentra, that take it upon themselves to publish recommended key lengths for symmetric algorithms and for asymmetric algorithms, public key algorithms. And I would accept their judgments. There are also lots of academic um, communities like eCrypt, which is a European sponsorship thing that do the same thing. So there are lots of sites where you can get opinions on how long you dare use a given algorithm with a given key size. But they all assume that the algorithm is not going to be broken in any sense other than through key search. So you won't, you can't expect and you won't get anybody that says I think this algorithm's got a flaw in it and it will be broken in three years because because if they thought that they'd keep it quiet and break it and that's it. But for key sizes the, there's many there are many sources. Okay. And then the hash functions the conference is the hash function should be shaken a bit because the NIST, the American body published an algorithm <coughs> called SHA, S H A and there's so it's a good SHA1, and then a set of Chinese ladies showed how to break it, and it completely took the West by surprise in the sense that we all thought that Sha Wang was okay. So China entered the arena, and we're not quite sure what they've got up their sleeves, so there's been a new contest, and there's another Sha album to be announced soon. Now, things out, isn't it? Out? Yeah. yeah. Last year, Fred, is there any thought? Sorry, are there any thoughts on, on mathematical advances? The whole uh, P and NP complexity class issue, because that's you know one of the great unsolved mathematical problems, but potentially very solvable, and that would sort of blow a lot of yes, that there, there are lots, out of the water. There are lots of things that will blow things out of the water if they're true. And the only reason that mathematicians have confidence they're not true is because they've never proved they're true. Yeah. Um, but they haven't been able to prove it's not true either. <laughs> that's right. No, that's right. So it's a, it's a don't know. Yes. I mean, factoring is a very good example. There is no proof that factoring is a hard problem. Right? At the moment, it's sub-exponential in the language we're using now, but there's no proof that there's no polynomial time algorithm to do it. Mm. We just haven't found it. But so many people have tried for so long that the mathematics community believes that it's justified and governments are prepared to implement it. And banks are prepared to implement it and you're probably all prepared to implement it. Mm. But there's no proof. And someone could suddenly go, aha, tomorrow and that's right. But it doesn't matter how long you make the shift. That's right. And equally, um, with no disrespect to religious people in the audience, there are people who believe there's a divine power who might even tell them things. And there's no defence against that either. There's just there's no defence against guessing, and there's no defence against wrong assumptions. If your assumptions are wrong and you base your security on them, then you have no security. However, there is very strong evidence in the mathematical community that factories are a problem. Provided quantum computers don't come along. Hmm. And so the, the never ending debate, exactly what we've been discussing now, right, is what gives you confidence in a, an algorithm? Standards? Or you ask the opinions of experts. Well, neither of those are very satisfactory because the standards won't be able to prove they're secure, they're just really just the opinions of experts again. And the only debate was should we use publicly known algorithms or proprietary algorithms? And now that debate's moved on a bit because there are now some very good, we believe, publicly known algorithms like AES. And most people would be happy to use AES. I 
I'd be happy to recommend you use the AES process. If you want to, you want to dedicate your algorithm with design, I'm free with pleasure. Charge you the earth for it. But there's no advantage because I believe AES is good enough. <clears throat> but do be careful that the fact an algorithm is published and unbroken doesn't tell you it's strong. Because you need evidence that people try to break it. And I tell you a story that happened to us in about 1982. I got a I used a post in those days, so I came through a post and an envelope saying, Here's my encryption algorithm. I challenge you to break it, and the prize for breaking it will be on thousand pounds or whatever it was, I forget now. And I spoke to my team, we were all busy, so we just binned it. Six months later, the guy phoned up and said, You sent your album six months ago, we're now going to publish a list of all the academics who couldn't break it, and you're on the list. I said, but if you put me on the list, I should deny it because we haven't tried. And I strongly suspect that nobody had tried. Because there's no gain in trying to prove, break an algorithm for anybody unless you're paid to do it. Or unless you think it's atrocious. And even if it's atrocious, there's no credit to an academic in breaking an atrocious algorithm because the journal won't publish it. Do you subscribe to the view that a public algorithm is potentially stronger, let's say, and that was quite an emotive word, um, because it's open to inspection by a, a greater number of people. No. I think the being open to inspection by a greater number of people is not the right criteria. You want it to be inspected by a greater number of people. And if you take the Etsy algorithms for the mobile phones, right, we are one of a group of six, seven, eight, I forget the number is, of European universities who get involved in the assessing their algorithms. And we are paid, I think it's for 50 man days to do a certain part of the assessment. And I strongly suspect that Etsy get more attention on their algorithms by paying communities to do it than publishing it in some loose journal and hoping that people look at it. Now, it may be wrong. Because I don't, we don't know. If you put something in open source, you don't know who's tried to break it. You also don't know if they've broken it. At least if you have a structured program for testing it, you know it's gone through a certain amount of testing. Now, that's a view that's not universally shared, and there's, I can present the argument for the other side, but you asked me what I personally thought. And my personal view is that if you take an algorithm and you just put it on the internet and say, please try to break this, I don't know who's going to try. I honestly don't know who's going to try. If it's an important algorithm, like AES was, then we know people tried because we were invited to do it and everybody wrote into this central body that coordinated the responses but just an arbitrary algorithm with no, no authority and with no, no particular status, just put on the internet and said, please assess it. I don't know who to say it. Maybe, maybe more people would do it, I just don't know. But usually the, the common practice would be to make sure that somebody looks at it. Have I answered it or dodged it? I'll let you for that. Okay. <laughs> so this is the never ending debate. And then Kirchhoff's principle is very important. Kirchhoff's principle says that the security of a cryptographic system should not depend on keeping the algorithm. In fact, this is the answer to your question, I guess, secret. What it doesn't say is the encryption algorithm must be made public. Right? Kirchhoff's principle does not say encryption algorithm should be public. It says the, encrypt, the security of a cryptographic system should not rely on the algorithm being secret. They're different things, right? So you design your algorithm as if it were public, but you don't make it public. However, there are certain systems where the public as a whole <coughs> needs to have confidence the algorithm is strong. So financial institutions and medical records and so on probably need to use public algorithms. But if 
you know, for BT, you said, you know, if BT use their own proprietary algorithms, why shouldn't they? They've got their own expertise in house. <coughs> why should they put it on the public plane? Kurt Joss Frizz certainly does stipulate it. However, if, if, if the application requires public confidence, then there's a big case for doing it. So this slide actually answers your question even better. Yeah? But it's not just about algorithms. As long ago as 1980, I think it's 1982, I collected a conference organized by Thorny and I, and it was called Security as People. And I remember the title perfectly because I was not sure that that's grammatically correct, but that's what it says. And then there's Ross Anderson's paper in 19, early 1990, 1991 and 92, about why crypto systems fail. And it lists, I forget how many, but it said 10, 12 reasons why in those days crypto systems failed that didn't rely on breaking the algorithm. So you have secure algorithms, or really it's not saying, it wasn't tackling issues, is the algorithm secure or not? What it's saying is, but the house security algorithm, there are other issues of breaking the crypto system. That's a very good paper, you should read it. Now, this is the fact of life. While in theory there may be no difference in theory and practice, in practice there is. And it's no good getting the theory right if you don't get the practice right. Which reminds me, what time am I supposed to finish? Sorry. Um, eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. And, and a very good example is RSA. <coughs> right? RSA is a public key algorithm, and part of the key is a modulus. Is a and the part of the key, so it's the product of two secret primes. So RSA, you take two large primes, multiply them together, and publish the product. And in general, determining the private key from the public key involves finding those two primes. So RSA relies on the fact that this modulus can't be factored. And there's a mathematical truth. Statement says factorization is difficult, and therefore, for this large module, RSA is secure. That's the theory of RSA. It's the theory of RSA now. It was the theory of RSA in the 1980s when it was first introduced. But this theory assumes that the attacker is going to use mathematical factorization algorithms. In practice, they don't do it. In practice, in the early systems, what happened was. The primes have to be generated somewhere. The early things had generators, physical generators, that could only generate something like a million primes. So you took the generator, you generate all the primes it could generate, you knew the answer you wanted was in there, so you didn't have to factor this into, you just tried all the primes in turn. So in the early implementations, the physical implementation meant that the theory didn't fit the practice. Because the, pra the theory said, in order to factor this modulus, you need to use this mathematical theorem. But in reality, the generators being used were generated so few primes that you could just generate all the primes in an exhaustive prime search. So did we learn from these early mistakes? Well, theory, yes. <coughs> I lectured on it in whatever it was, but in practice, certainly not. Why not? Let's have a look. I don't know how many of you are mathematicians, but when you get to three or four hundred bit, three, three or four hundred digit numbers, essentially they're all primes. I mean, one in every ten or something is going to be a prime. So there are an awful lot of primes, and no way if RSA keys or primes are randomly generated, will two people generate the same prime? The probability is just so small you can discount it. However, a group of people went around looking at all the public keys that were published on the internet, various people, and they found that in the sample of 6.6 .6 million RSA keys, which is large enough to have a reasonable test, but small enough that there shouldn't have been any 
overlap at all, over 4% of them either had this common modulus or shared a prime. Now, while factory is very hard, finding the greatest common denominator of two numbers is very easy. Very simple to find the greatest common denominator of two numbers. And therefore, these RSA systems, in your 6.6 .6 billion RSA systems, 4% were just useless, if they had this information. So we didn't learn. And there's this paper written by Len Stroma, there's an et al, the et al's about six people, I can't remember the names. And what it says is that if this fact could be exploited, if this fact could be exploited, then it could affect the expectation that the public key infrastructure is intended to achieve. In other words, people are not implementing the theory correctly. So while the theory is good, the practice is crap. That this information here shows that people are not generating their primes properly even now. Excuse me, quick question, why aren't they doing it properly? Good question. I'm not an influencer. <laughs> <laughs> um, Is it difficult? Is it... Uh... No, no. Let's go back here. Look, <clears throat> I can tell you how to generate random numbers. I can tell you how to, gen how to test whether they're prime numbers or not. So I can tell you, in theory, how to do it. Now, why don't implementers do it? I don't know. This is one of the mysteries of the universe. And um, if you're a bank, then you might be very unhappy with you want to check that your implementer, your service provider, or whatever it is, does it. I don't know, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that question. Is it difficult? I don't think so. Is it expensive? Well, it's more expensive generating different primes each time than slipping one in now and again. I, I don't know. Can't answer the question. Um, should they do it? I'm sort of using that no. <laughs> Is this a desirable situation? No. Why does it happen? I don't know. Someone is not doing what they should be doing. For what reason? Who knows? Sorry, I just don't know. It's the truth answer that. So, now you're looking at the system. In the system, you use strong algorithms to prevent attackers from calculating or guessing the keys. But those keys need to be stored and or distributed throughout the system, so they need protection. Right? You've, got, you've got this cryptographic system, you've got an algorithm, algorithm needs a key. Whether it's a private key in a, in a public key system, or the encryption or decryption key in a symmetric system, doesn't matter. The keys have got to be stored and distributed through the system. And they need protection. How do they get this protection? Well, there are various different ways. You might give them physical protection. So they might exist in tamper resistant security modules on smart cards. You might split them up into components so that the key never appears outside of one of these physical modules except in bits. And then the module puts them together. Or you might have key hierarchies where one key has no role in life except to protect another key. And these are called key hierarchies, so you have a level of keys and each one protects the one underneath it. If you have a key hierarchy, then whatever's at the top of the hierarchy has no key to protect it. So you can't have every key protected by another key. So you're forced to either rely on components or in physical security. And in most systems you have to rely on physical security somewhere. You've got to keep the components apart and they're probably going to be combined inside a tamper resistant module. Now already then you've gone away from the 
cryptography and you've gone into tamper resistance and if you come to me I mean, I'm a cryptographer I'm not qualified to tell you how tamper resistant a tamper resistant module is. TNO in Holland issues certificates, the National Physical Authority issues certificates, maybe PD2, I don't know, but there's a separate aspect now here and you've got to know what you're relying on. And then there, when you've got this hardware, <coughs> what happens? Well, there are now things called side chains attacks. You have a key that's inside a bit of hardware. The bit of hardware has got to use that key. So there are now what are called side chain attacks, which draw information from the physical implementation of the algorithm at hand. <coughs> and that might be looking at the power source or looking at timings for various bits coming out. And if you take a computation in exponentiation, for instance, then when you're exponentiating, you write the exponent in binary form, and then when there's a naught in the binary form, you square. And when there's a 1, you square and multiply. So implementing the bits where there's a 1 takes longer than implementing bits where there's a 0. So you can do what's called timing attacks that identifies the keys. And there are all sorts of attacks that um, <coughs> can take a physical device, <coughs> differential power analysis, differential timing, and so on, and the net result is that side channel attacks have changed the way cryptographers think about security. And the properties of digital circuits are now much more important than we ever used to think they were in the 80s. So good algorithm design now has to worry about side channel attacks on any implementation of new hardware implementing the algorithm. And what's happening now is that attacks now concentrate on the implementation and the accompanying protocol, <coughs> rather than looking straight at the algorithm. So cryptography's changed. Old farts like me who used to invent algorithm in the 80s, we can't do it anymore. Because we never used to say, count all these other new things you have to get into. It's had to change. And academic research has become much less blue skies and focused on the real problems. And theory and practice are getting closer together. And it's being forced on us by the fact that the criminal fraternity are organising themselves. If any of you work in security, you'll know that if you go to the internet now, you can work, find, I do anything. I mean, any crime you want to commit, go to the internet and I guarantee you there'll be something on there that will tell you how to do it. Why is this relevant here? Well, let's just look at, um, Implementing, exploiting error messages. What is the object of an error message? Well, let's take a very good example that comes everywhere. ATM transactions. You go to an ATM and you make a mistake, or something happens, and the ATM doesn't give you the money. Now, in order to be helpful to you, the bank tell you what's gone wrong. So they issue three error messages. I think if, there, if there's another one I don't know, but it doesn't matter, these three will do for my purpose. One is they say you've got the pin wrong. Another they might tell you there are insufficient funds in your account. Or the third one they might tell you it's exceeded your daily limit. And all of these are meant to be helpful to the user. And they are helpful to the user because they're telling you what's gone wrong and in theory, enabling you to correct it so that you get your money at the time. But now, let's turn it into an attacker. Let's suppose that I have picked your pocket and I have your credit card, your ATM card. And I've also looked over your shoulder because I was standing behind you in the queue when you but you are very good because you put your hands over the thing. So instead of seeing all four digits, I only saw, let's say, three. So I've got three digits for your pin and don't know the other one. Well, 
incorrect pin tells me I made a wrong guess. So I know what to try next time, change it again. Insufficient funds in account tells me you're not worth robbing, so I throw your card away. Exceeding your daily limit means I come back at midnight and I get some more money. So this information, although it's there for very good reasons, can be, in rather artificial situations I'm creating now, turned into aids for the attacker. Now in this particular case, I'm not serious, I think these are the right things to do, but in other applications there are error messages that really do aid attacks. Now I'm very conscious of the time. Um, what I think I'll do is, one slide, let's skip through at the end, because you, you can have these slides and then... Yeah, I can make them available to anybody who wants them. But I'm quite happy. Yeah, PDF I mean, files. Uh, do, do feel free to carry on and people can ask questions because well, all you're doing thing. is moving into the question and answer session anyway. Well, cryptography is not security. Cryptography is only one piece of puzzle. It's a small piece, but in my view, it's still an important piece. Because for things like protecting your communications, in certain areas you need cryptography. Other areas, you can do without it. But most systems certainly break in elsewhere. Other incorrects, requirements or specifications, implementation errors, application level, social engineering, etc, etc, etc. And all of them end up breaking the system. And that's really what they're after. And security systems happen, and there's badly designed systems, inappropriate policies, human error, clever innovative technical techniques, misplaced trust. I mean, let's go to inappropriate policies. You all have passwords, I imagine. Maybe you don't. Maybe, maybe you're fast enough to use biometrics or something. Most people serve passwords. Most companies have a password policy. And to oversimplify, to oversimplify, a typical password policy should say something like, your password should be at least 14 characters long, should contain letters, alphabet, capital uppercase letters, numbers, punctuation marks, and so on, should be randomly generated, should be different for every system, and should never be written down. And that's an impossible policy. So it forces people to break it. Now, what should the policy be? That's not for me to say. But certainly your policy will be different if you're worried about locking yourself out of the system than it will be if you're worried about people hacking into your system. So there's a very real reason for having two different types of policies. I, I personally am much more worried about locking myself out of my systems, like the bank account, or whatever it is, than other people hacking in. So I like a password policy that's simple so I can remember it and do it. <clears throat> For other systems you can't afford that luxury, but then you've got to find a way of protecting your passwords. Some people have all their passwords on one token, which is fine, but then you're relying on the physical protection of that token. So whatever it is, whatever your password policy is, you have to look at its implications. Now public infrastructures, basically, I never really define what a public key system is, but you're, you have know, a private key and a public key. Public key is for encrypting, the private key is for signing or decrypting. And the problem is now, who, how do I know whose public key I'm using? And the typical solution is a certification authority that gives you a certificate that binds your identity to your public key. And it's always been known if the root CA's private key is compromised, then the whole infrastructure is affected because the private, the root key is one at the top. And we've been lecturing on that for years. Everybody knows it, but of course, the root thing won't be compromised because CAs know what they're doing and they'll be certified and they'll do all the rest of it. And then what happens? Did you know? Now, what does DigiNotes are? Well, the European direct there was a European directive that basically said European countries need to accredit their certification authorities. 
Many countries, the government accepted that. The UK chose to go for self-regulation, so set up something called the T scheme. But the Netherlands certified DigiNota. And DigiNota hosted many other certification authorities, issued SSL certificates, qualified certificates, government credits, so on. But hackers gave unauthorized access to the CA services and issued rogue certificates. It's a disaster. And it's there because the whole basis on which public key cryptography is founded was that the CA is trusted. And here's an example where the CA wasn't trusted. It was breached. And that poses an obvious question of who or what can we trust? And I hate to tell you, but I'm beginning to think the answer is nothing. <laughs> I mean, it's, um, what you can actually trust is being destroyed day by day by various things in the newspapers, by the, all the recent things that's going on with the Americans and the British and the government and so on. And whatever. I think I'm going to skip these because they're technical. Um, and we talk about changing. Some things never change. And one thing that's never changed is the widespread use of encryption for confidentiality has always been a concern for governments. And the debate that's taking place on the oh, sort of BBC News in the, in the sun, wherever it is now, is basically um, you have your data, you're told your data is encrypted when it's passed over to various people, and then there are rumours, and I don't want to say there are any more than rumours, that, hang on, but these people who protect your data are giving your keys to the American government, and therefore you're not secure. Now, it's not for me to conjecture whether that's true or false, but um, the government's position is clear. They are happy to support the use of strong encryption for good purposes, but they're unhappy about the use of strong encryption for bad purposes. And the problem with any policy like that is that the interpretation of good and bad is subjective and we and the government may disagree, or you and the government may disagree. You and I may disagree. I mean, it doesn't matter. But this is the oversimplification of the, the government's situation. And then the question comes, you see, so you've got the encryption of three particular parties, the sender, the receiver, and the interceptor. And the question then is, who, is the good, who are the good guys? And this concept is changing. In the 1980s, there were a whole host of books written, right at the beginning of the 80s, the first books really in cryptography. And whatever the authors believed, all the authors started from the assumption that it was the sender and the receiver of the good guys, typically the banks, and the interceptor was the bad guy, typically the bank robber of the 21st century. And then, various governments, the American government, the British government, have mm -hmm. got it all wrong. We're the good guys, but we have to be here to protect the nation. And that's again what the debate is going on in the, the press now. Now, there is a very good case, a very good case for governments intercepting. But it's a question of what they intercept and why. I'm not going to say whether it should be or shouldn't be, but we need to understand the implications. What is the law enforcement's dilemma, or government's dilemma? I actually believe the first one. I actually believe that the government don't want to intrude in people's private lives. That the ordinary citizen is safe in the government. And that's a personal belief which is being debated now. They certainly don't hinder e commerce. They do want to have their own secure communications. They occasionally use interception to obtain information. And there is such a thing as leading interception. And so occasionally they need to read confiscated encrypted information. And that certainly means, if you look at the third bullet point and the fourth and fifth bullet points, that means sometimes they have to be on the horizontal line. 
and sometimes they have to be on the vertical line. Now, if you're on the horizontal line, you want your encryption to be unbreakable in any technical sense. If you're on the vertical line, you want to break the encryption being used. You can't win on both lines. You can't break unbreakable encryption. And we don't know how to design an algorithm that's strong when the good guys use it and weak when the bad guys use it. So there is a dilemma. And this is the, what I think is gonna, the debate's now going to be forced out, is to, to what degree do we try to overcome this dilemma? Now, the one solution <coughs> is actually to say, OK, are you happy? Are you as citizens happy for your information to be secure from everyone except law enforcement? Because if you are, then you could give law enforcement your keys and then it wouldn't matter. If you trust the government. And then the question comes down to who do you trust? And that's a debate that I'm not going to go into. But there's no doubt that the governments have lost control of encryption. Because whereas in the late 70s, there's virtually nothing published. Now, you can buy books, you can buy textbooks, you can go on the internet, you can do anything you like to break these systems. And that is what I wanted to get to. This is my favourite slide. There's a man called Newton Minner who made a speech to the Association of American Law Schools in 1985. And it was a little embarrassing, I assumed he was dead. And then one stage I gave a lecture. And he wasn't in the audience, thank God, but one of his students was in the audience. He was an advisor to the American president a few years ago. He, after 35 years, he finished a comprehensive study of European law. Now, why am I doing this? Because one of the things about cybersecurity is that we want international standards. It is very difficult to get international standards in anything. In cyber security, in harder reason. And he, he explains very well why. In Germany, he found everything in the law is prohibited except that which is permitted. Reasonable state. In France, under law, everything is permitted except that which is prohibited, which is a slightly different emphasis. In the Soviet Union, which existed then, under law, everything is prohibited, <laughs> including that which is permitted. <laughs> and then, Italy, under law, everything is permitted, especially that which is prohibited. <laughs> now, of course you're smiling, and of course it's a joke, but it does illustrate a very serious point. Because there's an element of truth in this. And it does explain why it's so hard, even for <clears throat> Europe, to agree on how to behave in cyberspace. We can't agree. Will it ever happen? Not sure. And there I think I'll end. Thank you. What I'll do is I'll formally thank our speaker, close the session. But remember, we all have to leave at the same time. I mean, as long as I leave at half past eight, I'm quite happy to answer yeah. questions. So I'll formally close the session and then carry on speaking. So in terms of... Um, Is your way of clicking on this back? Oh, just, just ignore it, I'll switch it. I'll just go back. Okay, go um, oh, the, the picture at the beginning is nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, you Is know, that the way we to study it? I, I don't know about you guys. The, the, um, it's quite a... For those of us who are not mathematicians or working control... Uh, cryptography, I thought it was going to be pretty tough and uh, very heavy. And it is quite a complex subject, but the way you've covered it, 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 it just goes to show that not only do you know the subject so deeply and you've been working on it for such a long time, you're also such a damn good communicator. Uh, you've got such a nice voice, I've been listening to you for ages. No, 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 no. <laughs> Let's get the questions. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I learned a lot. and. Uh, uh, it's very informative, and I think you were also successful in your initial aim of making sure we enjoyed it. I enjoyed it too. So thank you very much for that. Um, just a reminder: uh, I will make this edited version of this YouTube uh, on YouTube available. If you're not quite sure where, where to get it from, drop me an email. And also, Fred said he make these slides available, I'll put that link at the same place. Yeah, you make the thing, right? Yeah, I'll have to make the <laughs> And uh, uh, what I suggest is uh, feel free to mingle 
have some tea and coffee and start that off with, can I get you a coffee fair? Sure. Great. Thank you very much. And feel free to ask questions. Have you got any questions? Mm -hmm. yeah. I was going to say, what do you regard as an advantage when you say significant advantage in breaking cryptography? Because perfect, from my very few minutes on Coursera before yeah. I went under the strain, was um, perfect is when a one or a zero is equal probability. Yeah. And, and then you're on, you're on tiny fractions, aren't you, away from that, that you actually regard as, a, as an advantage in breaking an algorithm. So, the, 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 be careful. So, can I re, re ask you the question, which I've got it right? Are you saying when can you break an algorithm? You, yeah, when do you think you've got an advantage in, in breaking it? Well, in the. Go, let's go back to Bletchley Park first. Right? Yeah. Bletchley Park case, what they did was they engineered for. A known message to be somewhere in the cryptogram. Mm -hmm. right? So they forced, forces engineered that the encrypted version of a given message would be in the cryptogram. Because they didn't know where it would be, but they knew it would be there somewhere. And typically, for instance, most of the messages used to start with, well, nothing happened yesterday. That sort of thing. And then the Enigma algorithm had the property that no letter would ever be encrypted to itself. So it was encrypted letter by letter, but no letter was ever itself. So then you took your crib, which is the message you knew was going to be there, and you slide it along. And any time you see the same letter above your message letter, you know that's not the cryptogram corresponding to those things. So you slide it all the way along, and you'll find certain positions that are possible. But then, in each of those cases, you've got a known plaintext attack. So you know the cryptogram corresponds to the message plaintext attack. And that gives you an advantage. So the advantage they got with it, other advantages too, but they, they exploited the design property that no letter could be encrypted as itself by then arranging for certain distinctive messages to be transmitted and looking for them by sliding this thing along in straightforward comparison. Okay. Now, if you're asking me, uh, ideally, a cryptogram should be look like random data. So, ideally in a cryptogram, the probability of each bit being a naught or one should be a half. And they should be independent of each other. And that sort of stuff. If you're asking me what level of bias can you break, mm. then I don't know what level governments can break. But it will depend on the type of cipher. If it's a stream cipher where you're encrypting bit by bit, then we teach our students how to break them when there's a 75% bias, which isn't surprising. And we don't go any further. Um, what could governments break? I don't know. I honestly don't know. Um, I'd be much nearer to 50 than 75. Okay. Uh, when you talked earlier about SHA-1 and um, yeah. the kind of the, the push and the ability to sort of break that, if that's yeah. the right sense, um, in real terms, <coughs> so obviously you, you're, you're up to getting two messages to come out with the same with the yep. same hash. Yep. Do those messages <laughs> obviously they're gonna have to be I'm guessing wildly different to no, no, come no. together with the same or do you kind of reserve on the fact that you could have you could just dump a huge amount of data and say the back end of one to get them to get them to match. Well it's sorry. I'm not Can I get a bit technical now? Yeah yeah with a hash function the object of hash function yeah, is yeah, a yeah. message of arbitrary length sure. and condense it down yeah. to a fixed length. Yeah. And a hash function is deemed to be, let's not use the word broken, discredited yeah. if you can find collisions, which is two, two messages, messages which yeah. condense down to a given bit string. Yeah. Now, mathematically, 
it's discredited if you can find two bit strings that condense down to the same hash. And that does, that's not quite the same statement as saying you can find two messages, because the bit strings may have no meaning in ASCII or whatever you're using, right? So you've got to distinguish from those to start with. But let's assume that all bit strings, then the easiest thing to give you an example is to list a man called Dobertin, who unfortunately is dead now, but he was, and he was breaking MD4. And he came to Holloway and said, I found hash functions in MD4. And I said, so what? And he said, well, aren't you worried? I said, well, no, not unless they're meaningful. So he said, what would convince you? I said, well, just find two meaningful messages that might bother me. So he came back literally the next day, and I've got a friend called Chris Mitchell who's in my department, and he had one message that says, Fred owes Chris one pound, and he had another message that says, Fred owes Chris a thousand pounds. And they had the same damn hash value. <laughs> and that, that convinced me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. SHA-1 is discredited in the sense that it, you know, the birthday paradox says that roughly if you've got a 160-bit hash function, then you should need to do 2 to the 80 trials to find a collision. The attack from the Chinese was theoretical in the sense they outlined an attack that required only, and the only should be in inverted commas, 2 to the 63 trials. Now, 2 to the 63 is much less than 2 to the 80, so SHA-1 is discredited. Right. Is it broken? Probably not. <laughs> 